All right. Welcome everyone to another virtual shouting session at Hearts for Health. Today we're joined by Dr. Plenty. Um, Dr. Plenty is a maternal fetal medicine specialist. We had earlier last week, if you were there on Saturday, uh, we had Dr. Sims, who was also an OB, um, but this is a subspecialty of OB we're going to be talking about here for high-risk patients. So we're really excited to be doing this, and especially having already seen OB going into MFM is really interesting. Um, I'm very excited for this, and I'm sure a lot of students here are too. As a quick few reminders for those who might be new, um, or if you just need a quick reminder about how shouting works, we have presentations with different specialties and different speakers. You'll see presentations and everything from OB to surgery to internal medicine. Uh, and towards the end of each of these sessions, after a speaker is done going through their discussion, going through a few cases and all, we have a Q&A that opens up. So the last 20, 30 minutes of this session will be dedicated towards a Q&A. This session will be two hours. Um, and while we go through these, uh, session, while we go through the session, while Dr. Plenty continues to discuss further topics, feel free to type in any questions that you have for her, and we'll go through all of them during the Q&A as best we can. For those who want to stay updated with future shadowing sessions, you can follow us on Instagram, where we send out posts for upcoming shadowing sessions, similar to the one that you likely have seen for Dr. Plenty. And we also have our listserv, which is where we send out announcements over a weekly email on Tuesdays for not only shadowing sessions, but also our program announcements. Both are great ways to stay tuned with our program. You can use either one or both uh, to join our listserv. You just have to, to subscribe. At the very bottom of our website, we have a subscription form. Write your name in, write your email address in, and click subscribe, and you'll be good to go. You'll be added to that list, again, where we send out weekly emails. That's all that we have for reminders, and with that covered, Dr. Plenty, feel free to take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, uh, for the introduction. Um, and thank you guys for being so patient with us. I had some technical difficulties, you know, technology is never, uh, never works when you want it to work. So Michael has graciously stepped in and is helping uh, run the slides for me. Um, I am on my phone, so I apologize if something comes across or a phone call and I have to hit, um, you know, uh, decline, but, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So um, I'm Nicole Plenty. I'm a double board certified OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist. I'm also the founder of Pregnancy Pearls with Dr. Plenty, which is a podcast as well as a blog that I started after I had a high risk pregnancy myself and a near death experience. And I wanted to help patients to advocate for themselves. So through that, the podcast and the website, um, I try to give people resources so they know exactly how to navigate safely through pregnancy and what questions to um, ask their clinicians and how to find clinicians. Um, as Michael said before, I know you guys had Dr. Sim. She's actually a really good friend of mine. Uh, I actually talked to her last week. Uh, she's an OBGYN at the University of Mississippi. And um, you guys will see once I go through like the how I got here, I did some training at University of Mississippi and uh, was one of her chiefs when she was an intern. So I, I know her very, very well. And she does really good work. Uh, I'm also on the American College of OBGYN's board of directors as of this year. I'm the young physician at large to that national board. And I'm also the American Medical Association delegate for the women physicians section where I advocate for women physicians, and health equity. Uh, next slide, Michael. So a lot of you guys may ask, like, what exactly is maternal fetal medicine? So a lot of people are like, what is that? Um, even clinicians that are internal medicine or surgery, they may not know what MFM stand for. Um, it used to be referred to as perinatology. So you have neonatology that takes care of babies that are in the NICU that are in critical condition. And perinatology is the same thing. We take care of moms that are in critical condition, but that name changed to maternal fetal medicine a while back because we take care of not only the mom in critical condition, but we also take care of the fetus. So the baby during the pregnancy before we hand that baby off to neonatology. Um, an OBGYN, we're OBGYNs, but we also only handle high risk OB and we don't do any GYN. That's the difference. So before you can become a maternal fetal medicine specialist, you have to be um, an OBGYN. You have to go through that OBGYN training. So in a nutshell, when I think about what exactly is an MFM, if I had to describe it, we're basically the OB or the obstetrical part of OBGYN 
We're radiologists because we do ultrasounds and diagnose conditions of babies in pregnancy. We're internal medicine doctors because we treat any medical condition during the pregnancy, some of which our internal medicine doctors or endocrinologists or cardiologists may not feel comfortable with because pregnancy changes maternal physiology. So the, the body is much different in pregnancy than it is outside. So we have to step in and take care of a lot of conditions with different organ systems during pregnancy. And then of course, we're also critical care for the pregnant mom. So during this pandemic, I've been doing a lot of critical care of moms with respiratory compromise due to COVID-19 in pregnancy. And we're working with respiratory therapists and managing vent settings because the vent settings and respiratory status adjustments in a pregnant woman is much different than outside of the pregnancy. So for example, if your pH is 7.4 and we're trying to, to make your pH and, and drive your respiratory rate to a pH of 7.4, well, in a pregnant woman, that would be almost putting her in a comatose state. Like she can't be at a normal pH um, because of the pregnancy. So we remind our critical care colleagues of those things. And we basically co-manage a lot of critical care patients during pregnancy. Next slide, Michael. So when I think about, is this something you want to do, right? So um, MFM is pretty competitive in terms of uh, the subspecialties of OBGYN. So you have, um, you know, you do go into OBGYN residency. So that's moderately competitive af after you get out of medical school and then, which is four years. And then after that, you can decide whether you want to be a general OBGYN or whether you want to go into some of the subspecialties. Maternal fetal medicine is one of those subspecialties. You have reproductive endocrinology and infertility, which is getting people pregnant. That's another subspecialty. Then you have uh, basically uh, pelvic reconstructive surgery or urogynecology is another name that deals with slings, urinary incontinence and things like that as the woman ages. Uh, and then you have uh, minimally invasive surgery, which a lot of people don't have to do a fellowship for that. It's not one of the board certified fellowships. You only have the three board certified fellowships, but it is something that people are now starting to specialize in and get more training in even after they finish residency. So you can choose one of those four main paths. And then there's also family planning. Some people only want to do family planning um, that via that counseling or via that learning how to do terminations of pregnancy. So you really have five paths, six really, if you count general OBGYN that you can go after you finish. But I think that MFM is the best path. Okay. So it's all pregnant patients. It's fast paced, so you must act in emergency. So we do have trauma. So if you have a trauma and it involves a pregnant woman, it's MFM that's coming to the rescue there with your trauma surgeons. Um, it's not as hectic as trauma surgery because you don't have as many traumas in pregnancy than you do outside of pregnancy just by sheer volume. But it's still hectic enough that you get your, I call it adrenaline rush. Um, you treat a wide range of diagnoses in pregnancy. So if you can't choose between endocrinology and cardiology and nephrology. Well, guess what? With maternal fetal medicine, you get to do all of that. You get to treat kidney disease and cardiac disease and thyroid disease in pregnancy. If you uh, have patients with cancer, you're working with the oncologist for a treatment plan that's safe in the pregnancy as well. So you get to treat a wide range of diagnoses in pregnancy and work with a lot of different specialists. You can deliver babies. Some people, some MFMs don't deliver any babies and only act as consultants. You are evaluating reasons, reasons for miscarriage. So meaning, hey, does this baby have a chromosomal abnormality as a reason that there is a miscarriage or is there something structural that's going on with the baby? Of course, like I said before, you do deal with maternal ICU cases um, and you have a really high impact on patients' lives because some of the decisions you make are gonna make or break a mom's life. And some of the decisions you make can make or break whether a baby is going to survive or not. So it's a very rewarding field um, if it's something that you think you want to do. Next slide, Michael. So the benefits of maternal fetal medicine um, you get to be with patients on their happiest, most important day of their life, which is either when they're finding out they're pregnant or when you're delivering the baby. 
you can help high risk moms get through pregnancy. So people that didn't think they would ever have a baby, you're helping them get through. Um, you get to do procedures. So you get to do ultrasounds. Um, you get to do amniocentesis, which is when we insert a needle into the uterus, we draw fluid around the baby and then send that off for the baby's genetic makeup. Um, you do also just do some amniocentesis guided procedures. So if there's fluid in the lungs of a baby, just like if there's fluid in a, a lungs of an adult, that, that lung needs a chest tube to heal. Well, you do the same thing in the baby. We can place chest tubes in babies inside the uterus via ultrasound guidance. Now, obviously that little tube we're putting in the chest of the baby is really, really small, but it's really cool and real, really rewarding to get to do those procedures to help get the baby to survivability when otherwise the baby would not even have lungs that would be able to develop during the pregnancy. We do do chorionic villus sampling, which is basically um, biopsying the placenta to send that off for the baby's genetic makeup very early in the pregnancy at 11 to 13 weeks. We do procedures like DNCs if a patient's had a miscarriage um, or a DNE, which is the same as a DNC, except for a DNE stands for dilation and evacuation, where the DNC stands for dilation and curatage. A DNE is done in the second and third trimesters after you've had a fetal loss. We basically remove the inside contents of the uterus by removing portions of the baby at a time. The DNC, because the baby is very small, it's basically putting a device in to suction the inside of the uterus. Now, if the baby's bigger, you can't just suction. So that's why there's a difference between a DNC versus the DNE. Most general OBGYNs aren't gonna do DNEs. Um, so that's something that's usually specific for maternal fetal medicine doctors to evacuate the uterus. We do a lot of C-sections and sometimes we do those C-sections because we're doing what's called exit procedures on a baby. So if let's say the baby has a mask on the sacrum and it's not safe for the baby to deliver vaginally because the baby might get stuck, we can deliver that baby via C-section and gently lift the, the pelvis of the baby out of the uterus atraumatically. So we call those atraumatic C-sections or there's any other defects. So sometimes their babies are born with a lot of things um, that may be more friable, meaning we can't just do a normal delivery. We have to have extra delicate hands on board. We will be doing those types of C-sections in conjunction with our pediatric surgeons that are standing nearby to go ahead and send the baby off to surgery. Many OBGYNs, as well as MFMs, do do cesarean hysterectomies. Um, we sometimes do those in conjunction with our GYN oncologists who are our cancer docs. That's another, I missed that field. That's another field, subspecialty of OBGYN um, that's really competitive as well. That's just gynecological cancer in pregnancy and they do a lot of surgery. And so we are sometimes working in conjunction with them if we have placental invasive disease. So the placenta is the afterbirth. And sometimes if you had several C-sections or different types of surgery on your uterus, like the surgery to remove fibroids, it can cause scarring. And that scarring can cause the placenta to adhere too tightly to the inside of the uterus. And that would put the mom at risk for heavy bleeding. And to prepare for that, we diagnose that during pregnancy. And we tell the patient, hey, you may have to have a hysterectomy, which is removal of your uterus at the time of the C-section. So we deliver the baby and then we keep the placenta or the afterbirth in place and then proceed to do a hysterectomy. Now, sometimes the placenta can invade all the way through the uterus and into the bladder or into the bowel or into the wall of the abdomen. And that sometimes takes us, our G1 oncology co colleagues, and sometimes even urology or general surgery to safely deliver the baby and remove this, the uterus and repair anything that's attached to the placenta. So those are called cesarean hysterectomies. Maternal fetal medicine usually is involved in those cases. And then we also do laser ablations. Now laser ablations are usually reserved for our fetal centers, okay? That's when you have twins or multiples that share placenta and you can have what's called twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And so when twins share a placenta, there's about a 15% risk that one baby can get more blood supply than the other baby. And when we see that sometimes, that may mean that the baby that's not getting good blood supply, we see abnormal blood flow from that side of the placenta to the baby. 
And when we see that, that baby doesn't have a lot of fluid and the other baby that's still in all the blood has a ton of fluid around it, amniotic fluid. The baby with a lot of fluid also can have a big bladder and the baby that has not a lot of fluid, we usually don't see a bladder. And then eventually it can progress to the baby that is not having a lot of fluid also showing signs of abnormal blood flow through the umbilical cord. When we see that, then we do what's called a laser coagulo ablation. And that's when we go in with the little camera and illuminate the vessels within the placenta. And we basically burn off any connections we see between one side of the placenta to the other to basically stop that blood sharing. And we do that to try to purposely help the flow stabilize in the smaller baby. And that way the patient can progress and go on into deliver at around 36 weeks. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, but we, um, it does work about 80% of the time. So we monitor people with twins that share a placenta to see if they need a laser ablation to stop the connection of those blood flow. So MFMs would be the people that are doing the actual laser ablative surgeries, okay? Now our call, so when we talk about lifestyle, it's beneficial because we get to do all this cool stuff on all these like really complicated pregnancy cases and fetal anomalies, but our call is much lighter than the typical OBGYN. So I take call from home. Most maternal fetal medicine doctors, I don't think I know any maternal fetal medicine doctors that take call in the hospital because usually we're doing a lot of co-management with our OBGYN colleagues. So we help set up a care plan and we're only really at a delivery if there's something complicated going on. Somebody that's having quintuplets, we may deliver them personally. Triplets, we may deliver them personally. A baby that needs an exit procedure. So there's a mass in the neck and we have to deliver the baby partially so that ENT can intubate the baby and then take the baby out to surgery. We're delivering those people. But everyone else, moms with hypertension and diabetes, we're basically making a care team for that patient. So when they come in in active labor, their OB is there to deliver, th to deliver them. So they still get to do regular care with their OBGYN. And we just call act as consultants from home to say, hey, that patient is there. Okay, we need to make sure that these things are in place. So we act mainly as consultants. So our call is a lot lighter. Um, we're considered the go-to experts for pregnant women. So if you want to be an expert in something, Maternal fetal medicine is where it's at, okay? Um, we work with our OBGYN colleagues who are absolutely amazing when it comes to routine OB and GYN care, but when things are a little bit complicated, we're the people that hone in and actually make sure there's a multidisciplinary care team, and we're the people that says, hey, we know the textbook says this is when someone needs to be delivered, but in this situation, this patient needs to be delivered earlier because of these things. We're those people. Um, maternal fetal medicine is very rewarding and it's very stimulating because we're always staying up to date on data. We're always trying to find the latest research in terms of survivability because so many things in pregnancy are experimental. So some of it is like trusting your gut. Some of it is reading research papers and deciding what to apply to your patient because everything is unique when it comes to high risk and pregnancy. And so some things are not by the book. For example, COVID-19, you know, even the protocols that came out, people were like, I don't know if that's applying to pregnancy. And it's up to MFM to say, you know what, we have nothing to lose. We need to try, you know, this, or let me go and dig and see what happened in animals when they took Paxlovid or what happened when people took remdesivir to see if we are willing to take that risk and try it or reaching out to our other colleagues and say, hey, have you tried this yet? I tried this, it didn't work. Did you try that? This didn't work. So it's very stimulating. And the MFM field is so small that I, I mean, I have probably 75 MFMs on my phone that I am constantly interacting and texting with just to make sure we're all, you know, touching and agreeing and seeing what's the latest, you know, data on um, different issues that we may face every day. Michael, next slide. So the downfalls of MFM, it can be very stressful, right? It can be stressful because you're in a field that it's not really textbook written. So you're the person that's having to figure out like, 
how am I going to get this patient off the vent? Do I prone this mom and turn her upside down right now, knowing that she's going to desat? How am I going to prone her? Because we don't have any pregnancy pillows to put her belly in. Like, let's be creative and get a whole bunch of pillows and cut the middle out and tape them together. I mean, those are things that we had to do during this pandemic, like creating pregnancy pillows for proning. Like there was not such thing before this pandemic. Um, it can be very emotional due to a chance of poor outcomes. I mean, I had to tell a patient just today, like your baby has trisomy 18, which is considered a near lethal um, chromosomal abnormality. You know, her baby had a major heart defect. And I knew, you know, your baby has a major heart defect. Do some of these babies survive? Yes, but your baby won't survive because those babies don't make it off the operating table if they have complicated cardiac conditions. And some of them, depending on how severe it is, are not even operative candidates. So they're only candidates for palliative care. So you can imagine talking to a family that comes into your office thinking they're just coming because they have advanced maternal age and they're 35, but they're otherwise healthy, telling them the worst news of their lives. And that is, I know you're excited about this pregnancy. Your baby may not survive. This is nothing that you've done wrong. And a lot of it is making sure patients understand their diagnosis, making sure people understand their options and making sure moms understand that they did not do anything wrong. Um, and then complicating that with, you know, I'm in Texas. So, you know, SB8, which basically bans uh, terminations after six weeks and now the overturning of Roe v. Wade has made things even more emotional. Like I, that patient today was like, I don't want to carry the pregnancy. And I'm like, well, you really have no choice unless you go to fly to Colorado or California or somewhere because now almost all of the Southern states have banned terminations. And when they think that, when you think about terminations, you know, I, I was raised Catholic. So I'm, you know, I've always been, you know, pretty much pro-life, but pro-life doesn't mean anti-choice. And when we think about laws, we don't think about the things that maternal fetal medicine specialists deal with. Like I'm not dealing with people that may have unwanted pregnancies. 99% of my patients want their pregnancies, but then they're devastated because their baby is missing a part of the brain or their baby has a lethal chromosomal abnormality and now they're forced to carry their babies to term or until they have a complication that forces us to say, okay, you have high blood pressure, now you're at risk for a stroke. Now we can justify delivering you. So it's, it's very emotional when you have to talk to a patient about you know, the, their baby not surviving or a lethal condition. So it's not for you if you don't like giving bad news um, and you can't talk through the bad news. Um, sometimes moms die. You know, obviously I take care of people that have had strokes in pregnancy. I mean, the first time I see them may be because they're in the ICU and they're routine. I'm taking care of moms that have gotten car wrecks and they're in comas. I'm taking care of moms that have COVID and they're on the ventilator. And so sometimes their patients die. I mean, OB is supposed to be a really happy field. You're like, yay, you're pregnant. This is the best time of your life. But for maternal fetal medicine, because we are also the people that are stepping in when moms are critically ill, we can't save everyone. You know, even the best things that we do still aren't life saving. So, you know, you can have moms die and you can have babies die too. When you have to tell a mom, you have a hypertensive emergency and you're 23 weeks and your baby has a 40% chance of survival. And out of that 40% chance, only 5% of the time is your baby going to have a neurologically intact survival, meaning walk, talk, make milestones that other kids make on average, 5% chance. You know, so those babies can die because they have, they're more likely to pass away at those early gestational ages than survive. But sometimes we have to recommend delivery to save a mom's life. So it is, you know, that's the downfall that you are sometimes giving bad news. And then you usually have call a week straight. So our calls are lighter, but we usually have longer durations of call. So there are only about 65 MFMs that finish training a year. So it's not a lot of us. They're, we're in very high demand. It's the second highest field to recruit for. So because of that, your institutions may only have a couple MFMs. You have 50 OBGYNs to three MFMs. And so we're on call seven days at a time on average, um, but we are on call from home. But if you're somebody that's like, man, this is really stressful, it may not be as for you. Michael, next slide. 
All right. So a little bit about me and how I got here. Um, I did my undergrad training at um, Xavier University of Louisiana, which is um, one of the uh, one of the uh, historically black college and university that is in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I was Miss Xavier University of Louisiana, and I also graduated with honors with a degree in biology or bachelor's of science in biology, uh, minor in chemistry, honors in math. I was only one of two people to honor in math. And people are like, why did you do that? I'm like, I just like numbers. Um, the other person that honored in math at Xavier was um, end up going into, what is she? A physicist. So it made sense for her to honor in math. For me, I just took math electives because I liked, you know, math and linear algebra. And, you know, you do what you, you do what makes you your, you know, your heart pump. So that's what I did. Um, then I did four years of medical school at Tulane University School of Medicine, which is also in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. I also, during that time, got a master's in public health uh, with a concentration in, in health systems management. And I did that because the pandemic hit, no, excuse me, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit my first year of medical school. And no one could really tell us when we were going back to New Orleans. And because of that, I wanted to know more about the health system. You know, how does this work? Where are our patients going? And um, a group of us started this free clinic for HIV patients in New Orleans. And we would drive back and forth from Houston, which is where we were displaced to. We were displaced to Baylor, back and forth from Houston to New Orleans to work in this clinic. And we wrote grants and things like that. And so the next semester, I decided to get a master's in public health with a concentration in health systems management because I wanted to know how the systems worked and how the system was impacted by um, Hurricane Katrina. And then after uh, my MD and MPH, I went on to four years of OBGYN residency at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, um, and then where well, I was chief resident. And then I went on to MFM fellowship, and I stayed there at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And during that fellowship is when I met Dr. Sims, who came in as an intern. And um, I was chief fellow. And then at that time, I decided hey, I want to go into private practice. So from there, I went into private practice. I practiced in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I was sort of, I went there thinking I was joining a group and the group left before I got there. So that forced me to be interim division director in my first year out. So that was a, a steep learning curve. At that point, I was really happy that I had the MPH in health systems management. And then after three and a half years in Indianapolis, I came to Houston, Texas, where I'm the, uh, the, the South Division lead for obstetrics MFM specialists of Houston. And now I've just signed a contract to be the, the, the MFM division director at Wellstar Health System in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'll be relocating to Atlanta, Georgia to be the division director next month. Next slide, uh, Michael. So, you know, the why. So whenever I was in high school, um, like I'm pretty sure some of you guys listening are in high school and you're trying to figure out like, what am I going to do with my life? Right. Or even in college, what am I going to do with my life? For me, I thought I wanted to be an attorney. So in high school, I did mock trial. I loved mock trial. I loved traveling and debating. Um, I was mock trial team captain. I applied to Tulane for undergrad. I had a legislative scholarship there. And then, um, I started learning a little bit more about medicine. And so I was nominated for the National Youth Leadership Forum on Medicine and went to Los Angeles and was blown away. And so I said, man, I really wanna be a doctor. I think I wanna do this instead. So I went and applied to Xavier, which was number one in placing African-Americans into medical school. That was my reason for going to switching. And during my undergrad education, my cousin who is pictured here named Esquinetta, she was 23 years old with her second pregnancy. She was thin. She was fit. She had no medical problems. She developed preeclampsia, which is when you have high blood pressure and vascular damage. We look for that as protein in your urine. And then she developed HELP syndrome. So preeclampsia, there's two theories. Some people think preeclampsia and HELP syndrome are two different conditions. Some people think preeclampsia and HELP syndrome are on the spectrum of the same condition. So for me, I was trained this on the spectrum. So she progressed to HELP syndrome, which is when you have elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. So 
So it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, low platelet syndrome, where your kidneys can begin to fail, your liver isn't functioning correctly, and therefore you're not making clotting factors because clotting factors are made in the liver. And so you consume all of your platelets that are trying to get your blood to stop bleeding. And so your platelets end up being low. And that can put you at risk for what's called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which is basically means you don't have any clotting factors. So if you bleed, you can just bleed and bleed and bleed and there's nothing to stop it. So she had HELP syndrome. She then developed DIC and then she passed away at age 23. Um, and she had a C-section at 28 weeks and deliver her son, Caleb. Next slide, Michael. So that was what made me really curious about like, how does this happen to somebody that is 23 healthy, you know, not a medical problem in sight and they die in pregnancy, right? So I started doing a lot of research on preeclampsia and that was a real reason why I decided to go to the University of Mississippi at that time was a preeclampsia capital of the world. Um, Dr. Jim Martin, who just passed away this year, wrote the guidelines on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and chaired the task force in 2013 on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So I knew that I wanted to go to that residency program, so much so that when I was an undergrad, I went and found the program director and said, hey, I really want to go to your program because I want to study under Jim Martin who was like a grandfather to me. So it was devastating when he passed away this year. But preeclampsia is something that affects a lot of African-American women and women of color. And so I want to make sure I took the time to, to tell you guys a little bit about preeclampsia. This is like MFM bread and butter. So we treat this, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not either diagnosing preeclampsia or evaluating somebody for it. You would think that it is not that common, but it, you would think it's, it's super common, but it's not. It's only three to 8% of pregnancies are affected by preeclampsia. And that happens when you have hypertension in pregnancy, meaning your systolic blood pressure is over 140 and your diastolic or your diastolic blood pressure is over 90 and you have protein. So preeclampsia is just high blood pressure and proteinuria. And we look at proteinuria as at least 300 milligrams of protein in a 24 hour urine sample. That can progress to HELP syndrome, which is what, what, I, what I said before, which is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet syndrome, or eclampsia. Pre means before. Eclampsia is when you have a seizure due to that breakdown of the blood brain barrier in the brain that leads to seizures that can be life-threatening and very difficult to control. So we don't wait to treat people with eclampsic seizures we treat people at preeclampsia because we don't know when they're going to end up developing eclampsia or even HELP syndrome, okay? And preeclampsia starts really, really early. Like at the level of the placenta, once the placenta starts to develop around 12 weeks gestation, it's not something that all of a sudden develops. So that's why we give people baby aspirin to try to help block some of those hormones that are secreted when the placenta starts developing. So we start baby aspirin between 12 and 16 weeks because of that to help reduce the risk of preeclampsia. But even with baby aspirin, sometimes people can still get preeclampsia. And the symptoms of that, if you have any friends or family that are pregnant, they have a headache that doesn't go away with Tylenol. That's the number one symptom, okay? So people that don't wanna take medicines and they're like, oh, my headache's just like a three or four. I'm like, take the Tylenol and see if it goes away, okay? So we tell people to take one gram or a thousand milligrams of Tylenol, so two extra strength Tylenol. And if their headache goes away in 45 minutes, great. But if their headache is persistent, they need to get checked out. And blurry vision, and I'm not talking about you're looking at the sun and you have spots in your vision, but no, like you're waking, you're walking around, all of a sudden your vision is blurry, or all of a sudden you have double vision, or all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of spots in your vision and you don't know why and you can't get them out. That's a symptom. If you have high blood pressure, those symptoms, that needs to be checked out. And then you can have pain over your liver. So the upper right-hand side of your belly, there can be pain when you press there. That's usually the rarest symptom, but that can also happen. This is what happened to my cousin. She was turned away. She had a headache. She went in. They told her that she was healthy. They didn't even check her blood pressure. They sent her home. Two days later, she had another headache. They got her to the hospital. At that time, she had high blood pressure. They treated her high blood pressure and they sent her back home. She was found down. She had an eclamptic seizure. 
And then she ended up going to the hospital and get this workup for finding out she had eclampsia actually that progressed to um, health syndrome. So, you know, it's making sure we all know the warning signs and knowing that it's serious. I mean, we, we treat preeclampsia all the time. I have to tell my colleagues all the time because we treat it as if it's nothing because we're used to treating it. But if it goes unrecognized, it can be very life-threatening and progress very, very quickly. Next slide. All right, so my typical day, okay? Oh, Michael, I guess it was a video that started playing, that will start playing. So for me, it's a video that starts playing. For you, I don't see it playing, but that is a video of me doing an ultrasound. And I don't think it plays for you, Michael. Typically, I wake up around six in the morning. Why do I wake up at six in the morning? Because I like to wake up early. Most MFMs don't get to work until nine. Some of them round after they work or on lunch. I like to round early. So I usually have conference calls around 7 a.m. if I'm not rounding early. And that's rounding on people that are inpatient in the hospital, on labor and delivery or in the ICU. I like to see them early. Why? Because I feel like the sickest patients need to be seen first. Everybody doesn't have that philosophy. I do. Okay. High risk clinic usually starts around 8 a.m., but my first patient usually isn't ready until nine. And that's because usually high risk clinic is in conjunction with ultrasounds. Okay. So if we're treating someone with high blood pressure, we want to know what their baby is doing in addition to what they're doing. So usually we have a sonographer that is doing the ultrasound. Here you see me doing the ultrasound because I'm doing, that picture shows me doing a uh, a fetal echo, okay, um, which is a little bit more specialized than ultrasound to make sure the heart functions okay. And it's very hard to get those images because you're moving around with the baby. Sometimes we have radiologists that rotate through when they're learning and they say, how do you get the baby to, to sit still so you can do the things you needed to do? I say, you don't, you move with the baby. So that's the thing about maternal fetal medicine and doing an ultrasound. You're moving with the baby. That's why it's a more complicated skill to have. And that's why it takes us three years on top of OBGYN residency to learn how to do that and procedures because you're doing procedures on people that are moving, okay? <laughs> My typical day ends around 5 p.m. Uh, sometimes I have lunch meetings at noon versus my rounding at noon, depending on if I have a new consult. And then occasionally I have a co uh, coordinated delivery. And that doesn't happen every day. That may happen once a month. Meaning a mom that has heart failure. I'm doing a coordinated delivery and making sure the uh, CT surgeons are on board just in case they have to crack her chest. Or if there's a fetus that has an abnormality, doing a coordinated delivery, making sure ENT is on board, making sure pediatric surgery is there, delivering that patient, handing the patient off quickly because we've coordinated, this is exactly what we wanna do. This is how much blood we need in the room. These are the people we need in the room. So I have one of those about once a month. And then I have call usually one week every four to five weeks. It's my typical day in MFM. Next slide. So uh, what happens when we go to clinic? So we do diagnostic ultrasounds. So we do ultrasounds to look at, hey, is the structure on the baby normal? Okay. Is the heart normal? We do echoes to look at the function of the heart if the structures are normal, but the function isn't normal. We do ultrasounds to evaluate growth and wellness um, of a baby. We do preconception consults before people get pregnant. So I have patients that may have had a history of a stroke when they're younger and now they're 35 and they say, I'm ready to get pregnant. Can I safely do that? We're the people that go through people's charts, coordinate care with other specialists to make sure that the timing is right for that patient to get pregnant. Um, and so we do consults before pregnancy to make a plan for that patient to get safely through the pregnancy. Or we say, hey, it's not time. We're going to put you on these medicines. We want you to come back in three months to see if your blood pressure is more controlled. Or you're on this medicine. Hey, you're on retinoic acid. We need you off of this medicine for three months. You have rheumatoid arthritis. You're on methotrexate. That can be, that can cause major birth defects. You have to have three negative pregnancy tests three months in a row before you get pregnant and off of those medicines. So we're the people that goes through everything with fine tooth comb to make sure it's safe for a patient to go ahead and get pregnant. We manage comorbidities such as diabetes, autoimmune disorders, high blood pressures, stroke, heart attack, anything in the ICU, we're managing it. We do procedures such as CVS or genetic amniocentesis, which is to get uh, a diagnosis of a baby. And we also do multidisciplinary meetings to coordinate care. So in these images, you can see this baby has uh, extra chromosomes, okay? 
So if you look at the pairs of chromosomes, that's a carrier type at the top of that, uh, at the page. And you can see we list each of the chromosomes out, okay? Uh, with one being your longer chromosomes all the way down to your sex chromosomes, okay? With chromosome, the 23rd chromosome being smallest. So you can see this baby has three chromosomes on the number 13 chromosome. So this baby has trisomy 13. And you can see on the 3D40 image below that, that baby has low set ears. That is one of the findings of babies with trisomies, okay? So babies with Down syndrome and trisomy 13 can have low set ears. But the most important finding would be inside the brain because 100% of babies with trisomy 13 also have major brain malformations. Michael, next slide. So what can, what can uh, you do now? Okay, if you want, you think you wanna be a maternal fetal medicine doctor. So you can make good grades, okay? That's really important because if you are in, in high school, you need to make great grades to get into college. Once you're in college, no one cares about your high school grades, but your college grades stay with you forever. Let me tell you, this stays with you for, you know, through residency, fellowship, they're going to ask you for those transcripts until you get done with training. So making good grades. If you, let's say you're in college already and you're like, ah, my grades are average. You can always do, you know, consider a post-baccalaureate program or a master's degree program to boost your application because they're going to take that higher uh, master's degree um, uh, GPA into consideration more so than your undergrad degree. So that can offset, that offset you if you have poor grades and, and you're already in college. Um, if you're in residency, residency, figure out if you like OBGYN first. So I always tell people, people say, oh, I want to be an MFM physician. You can't be an MFM without being an OBGYN. So if you think you don't want to be an OBGYN, you can't skip over that and do MFM. So if you don't like OB, you got to figure that out first, because if you don't like OB, then you definitely are not going to do MFM. You can get a mentor. So someone that can walk you through the, hey, have you thought about this program? Hey, have you thought about applying to this leadership opportunity um, to sort of push you in a direction to build your CV more? So getting a mentor to talk through your steps. Now, I want to say something about this whole mentorship, right? Because it's, it's not one way. Being a mentee is work, okay? So I have I think everybody should have a mentor. I have a mentor. I have a couple of them. But my mentors know that I come to them asking them for advice, but it's up to me to make sure I'm reaching out to my mentor and checking in. And then I'm asking them to help me with opportunities that I have sought out. So it is not on the mentor. So a lot of people, you know, I, I, I'm always reluctant to mentor people that aren't ready to be mentees, okay? Okay. And I say that because my husband say, you have really high expectations for the people that you mentor. And I'm like, yes, I do. Because my mentors had really high expectations for me. If somebody tells me they want to get into medical school, I'll tell them, the first thing I'll tell them is, you got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. You can't sleep. Okay, it's not the time to sleep till 8, 9 o'clock. You got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning because your day is going to start. You need to have you know, read an article in Time Magazine to increase your knowledge of current events because they're going to ask you about that stuff on step one. People think that they're not going to ask you about that on step one and your MCAT. They are going to ask you about that. Even if they're using that current event to tie into some other medical crisis, it's always good to know the current event. It makes taking the test so much easier if you've heard of what's going on. So, and it helps build your reading skill, reading comprehension skills. So I tell people, wake up early. Make sure you're reading an article in the news every day. Make sure you're checking your email every morning and make sure that you're following up on emails that are sent and make sure you're checking in with people that you need to check in with. If you meet somebody at a conference, that's the time you send and say, hey, this is, it's really nice to have met you at this conference. I hope we can stay in touch. So carving out that time before you start your college day or before you start your high school day is important. Now, my husband thinks I'm a stickler, but I tell you, the people that I've mentored that have done the things they need to do, there's one girl that I mentored that didn't get into medical school for like four years. And I would tell her, you need to meet me on labor and delivery at 6 a.m. So I need you to wake up and leave your house by 5.30. And there'll be days she'd get there and she'd say, oh, I was too tired or, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I said, okay, I didn't push it. But once she started to actually do those things and really prioritize getting into medical school, she is a doctor now. She's in residency now. 
And she was thankful. Like, I'm so thankful that you told me to wake up early because now when you're in residency, you're able to manage your time more because you don't have the time in residency. You have to manage and juggle and get things over with because at the end of the day, you're going to be so tired. So you learn to wake up early. You will be able to get get done a lot of stuff before your day even starts. So my husband thinks I'm a stickler, but I'm like, I'm really serious about that because I don't want to be more passionate than the person I'm mentoring. Like if you're not ready mentally, then don't ask me to mentor you because I'm going to get you ready. And I'm going to connect you with people and they're going to be like, Nicole, this person never reached out to me. And I'm going to be like, wait a minute, why did you reach out to that person? Um, because people can sometimes be very intimidated and scared when we say email this person. But if your mentor, even if it's not me, if your mentor has told you to reach out to somebody, nine times out of 10, they know them and they've already told them that they're going to reach out to you. Your mentee may not know that, but we know that. And, and so it makes us look bad when you don't do the things that we ask you to do. And if you can't do it, be honest and say, I can't do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. And that's okay. In addition to getting a mentor, shadow different people in the field. And your mentor can help you link up with people in your field. So I've mentored people that thought they wanted to go into OBGYN or MFM. And they say, you know what? I think I want to do, you know, be an endocrinologist and treat diabetics. That's fine. Let me link you with another endocrinologist so you can see if you like that. So your mentor can help you sort of navigate your interest a little bit further. My mentor and one that advocated for me the hardest is an internal medicine doc. I crashed on her sofa to interview for residency positions. She called people, literally picked the phone up and called every friend she had in OB and connected me with them. And that's the way I got some of my interviews. So your mentor doesn't have to be in the same field, but they can help you navigate other people to shadow to help develop you. And if you're an undergrad, I've always, already said that, consider a post back, especially if you haven't gotten into med school. Let's say you applied for med school, you didn't get in. Well, there are post baccalaureate programs that you can do that will automatically create a five-year pipeline to get you automatically accepted if you do well in that program. So there are post baccalaureate programs and master's degree programs that can boost your application and or get you accepted into medical school if you do well in those programs. And if you're in medical school or residency, do research in women's health, that can get you into maternal fetal medicine. Research makes a difference when it comes to fellowship and residency applications. So getting that research on your CV um, is important and can boost you. Next slide. All right, so I know that we've been talking or I've been talking. Do you have any questions for me? And if you do, if you drop them in the chat, I'll be more than happy to answer them. A lot of questions actually. So just starting from the first, um, it was a bit of a clarification as to, I think it's Roe v. Wade. The question is worded a bit uh, differently, but it, I think the student is asking if this translates to meaning that the mother, even when carrying the baby, that she still has to carry to term, even though she and the baby is at risk. Is that correct? No. So with Roe v. Wade, it basically says that the basically it makes term it bans terminations period so after there's a heartbeat there's no the mom cannot terminate now the exception is if it if there's a condition that's life-threatening to the mother and it can be proven then you can proceed with delivery of the pregnancy it's not considered a termination if it is a therapeutic abortion so there's different types of abortions there are spontaneous abortion just means you had a miscarriage, okay? You have elective abortion, which is what that law bans, which says, I don't wanna be pregnant and I'm just going to terminate the baby. And then you have a, you have a threatened abortion, which just means you wanna be pregnant and you're pregnant and you have vaginal bleeding in pregnancy, but the pregnancy is still there with a the heartbeat. The baby's still there with a the heartbeat. Then you have a missed abortion, which means you've already passed the pregnancy, but you still have a gestational sac with no baby inside of your uterus. And then you have a therapeutic abortion, which is when we terminate a pregnancy to save a mom's life. Technically speaking, you can do a therapeutic abortion, but you have to have two or more physicians touch and agree to say the mom has more than the 50% chance of death before you can do that abortion. And that is a really, now that with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, it's almost, it's so hard to get that done because all physicians think they're going to get sued or go to jail or lose their license. Um, for example, so we had a patient that had, it was 22 weeks and she had what's called chorioamnionitis. That's when you have an infection in your uterus 
and babies don't live well in infected fluid and moms can get sick really fast. They can get septic with, with, with an infection inside of the uterus. And usually pre Roe v. Wade over tournament, that would mean we would proceed with delivery regardless of the gestational age because a mom can get septic and die. Literally, we had to go through hoops, go through ethics. And it wasn't until the mom became septic that we were allowed to deliver the patient. So once the mom was septic and we had to intubate her, then we could deliver the patient. Well, obviously we don't ever wanna compromise, wait until somebody's on death's bed before we're moving to delivery of a patient, a baby that's not going to survive regardless. And so that was a situation that this new law has put us in. We have to prove that a mom is at extremely high risk of death before we can go uh, and proceed with um, delivery of a patient. So yeah, Roe v. Wade complicates it, but if we document this mom is going to die, we can proceed with delivery. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Another student asks, you mentioned you brought up how you graduated with an MPH and how that um, played into uh, you being an interim director earlier on. So they ask, can specializing in women's health for an MPH help with creating policies that help to spread more awareness and prevent issues such as maternal mortality, especially being a physician already? They're just really asking, what can you do? What are you further allowed to do with an MPH as a physician? So, um, you know, as a physician, you don't have to have an MPH. You know, as a physician, you have the knowledge you need to advocate for patients. But the MPH has helped me look at things from a public policy standpoint. There are certain things during this pandemic that my other colleagues may not have thought about, right? So when we talked about whether we're having visitors or not, some people are like, well, I don't understand why we can't have visitors. Um, because if the mom has COVID, then the, the, the patient's husband likely has COVID. So we should allow both of them in, right? And I said, yeah, but you have to realize that it increases the viral load in the room. So that means that the sonographer and the other doctors that are going in that room are more likely to contract COVID from somebody that's from two people in a room that are COVID positive as opposed to one. So the public health background allows me to think infection control and also allows me to think, let's talk about policies and how these policies can affect patients long-term. So I think that the MPH has helped me think more policy, of more of a policy mindset. And it's also the reason that I became really involved in the AMA and advocacy work dealing with women's health. But there are a lot of doctors that don't have MPHs that are advocating right alongside with me and going to Capitol Hill and lobbying and doing things like that. I think the managerial part of that MPH um, allowed me to have the skills to actually say, let's look at systems, right? Because uh, the health systems management just helped me study a lot of different countries and their systems and what worked and what didn't work helped me study a lot of different systems here in the US where we're talking about tide in their system versus gain, talking about Kaiser Permanente versus uh, HCA. You know, those are different systems that we had to look at. And, and so it allows me a lens to say, hey, let's look at the system and let's figure out what's not working and how can we optimize this system to allow the more patients to be seen um, more effectively and patients to be knowledgeable. How can we maximize um, how patients are cared for using different types of providers? So um, it's allowed me to have that type of lens and that type of expertise, but I can't say that only people with MPHs have that knowledge. Another student asks about since being in residency and fellowship, since your training years, how has MFM evolved since then? So uh, I finished training about 10 years ago, and I will say medical knowledge doubles every five years. So things that we were doing when I was in training, it, we weren't doing, we're not doing now. So from 2012 to now, things that we were doing, you know, we go back and forth with, do we use aspirin for preclinical risk reduction? Yeah, we were using it. Oh no, now it's vitamin C. Oh no, now it's vitamin E. Okay, now we're back to aspirin. So there are different things and different, you know, protocols that we use now that we weren't using then. And that's just because the more research happens, the more we change how and what we think of as standard of care. Um, back in the day, they weren't like, when my attendees were in training, 
they weren't doing uh, amniocentesis under ultrasound guidance. They were literally feeling mom's belly, feeling where the soft spot was in the uterus and sticking a needle blindly. And the theory was they basically didn't have a high complication rate because they're like, if a baby feels a needle, the baby will withdraw its extremity. So that was very successful for them. And now we do amniocentesis under ultrasound guidance. Everything's under ultrasound guidance so we can see the needle, right? But I can't say that what they were doing was wrong because they still had a complication rate of 0.03% versus 0.01 to 0.02%. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, things have changed. They weren't doing ultrasound to diagnose a lot of things. Um, even 15 years ago, they weren't. You know, now we can diagnose super complicated fetal anomalies and get care plans together. Um, when I was in training, we were just starting to do shunts in babies, like bladder shunts for bladder outlet obstructions and, and chest tubes in utero. Even 10 years before that, they weren't even thinking about doing that. And now it's like, ah, let's go ahead and place a shunt. It's just like the thing you do, right? So um, the more we know and the more we learn, the more we can experiment and the more we can hopefully save babies and have better outcomes. Another student asks about finding a mentor. So you touched on this topic, but they personally say that they've had a hard time seeking a mentor just because they feel like they're bothering them. Um, how, what's the best way to network and get around that connection? So I would first start with what you are interested in, right? So one of my, and like I say, I have very, I have several mentors. So I was always taught to have an advisory board <laughs> and and that's what I have. Like I have a mentor that can help me think about how to do branding and, you know, figuring out other things I can do outside of medicine to help spread knowledge, you know, for patients per se. I have a mentor that helps me in terms of leadership in OBGYN and MFM, who is another MFM. I have a mentor that's in Chicago, that's internal medicine. Like I was telling you guys before that helps me professionally but she's like a life mentor. She's like, what's going on with your marriage? You know, how's this move to Atlanta going to affect your kid? Like, have you thought about that? Then I have a mentor that's more of a collegial mentor that helps me in other outside organizations. So I would say if you know some, if you're watching somebody, so the mentor I have that's an MFM, before I got into University of Mississippi, I literally said, I won't be like her. Like I literally wanted to be like her. And when I went to university of Mississippi, I asked, could I meet with her? And she said, sure. And I literally said, how can I be like you? I literally started the conversation. And I said, how can I be like you? And she laughed and she said, Oh, you, you don't need to be like me. You're going to be much greater than me. And we had a collegial conversation. And now even to this day, if there's something that comes up, she's like, apply for this. Are you going to apply for this? You know, oh, I nominated you to be a board examiner. Okay. You know, I mean, th that's what mentors do. And when they put their names on the line, you do what you need to do to make sure that you make them look good. Okay. So I would say if you are on social media and you're following somebody that, and you want to be a cardiologist, start following cardiologists and inbox them and say, can we meet? I would like for you to mentor me. Let me tell you how flattering it is for somebody to, to ask to be a mentor. I mean, it's, it's a flattery. It's flattering. Okay. So don't ever think you're a bother. Now the question is, does that person have time to mentor you? Sometimes it's not that they don't want to mentor you. They may not have the capacity to do so. And you need to thank people that actually tell you that, like, I don't have the capacity to mentor you because if they can't meet with you periodically, once a quarter or what have you, then as much as you admire them, they're not a good mentor. And they can tell you, I got a lot going on right now. I can't mentor. A lot of people that mentor are going to put the onus back on you. They'll mentor you. They'll look at your stuff. They will tell you, get you connected. But you're going to have to be the person that nudges them to remind them. So if somebody tells you they want you, to, they're okay with mentoring you, Make sure to follow up periodically, okay? It's not a nag, it's not a bother. Make sure to follow up periodically and just say, hey, can we chat virtually? Or, hey, can you give me some pointers, okay? And just periodically check in. So the people that I mentor, they text me and they periodically text and, you know, check in. They FaceTime me, 
They ask me to go over their applications and their CVs. I do it. I send it back. Okay. So make sure that you are checking in, but just send people a message. You send them an email. If you find somebody that's at a university you really want to attend, email them and say, hey, I really want to go to this university. Could you mentor me? They will do it. Nine times out of 10, they will, they will be flattered to do it. So don't ever be afraid to ask. And I don't know if that was a woman that asked that question or a man, but I'm going to say it was probably a woman. Michael? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Sarah is her name. So. And I say that because um, there's this book by Linda Babcock that I, she's one of the authors, there's a couple of authors, but I went to an AMA conference and I went to a session when I was in residency and the section was women don't ask, <laughs> changed my life. I bought the book and I read the book from cover to cover. And after I read the book, I said, oh my God, I'm going to start asking for everything because the whole principle of the book was talking about the difference from men moving up the ladder versus women. And the only difference the data showed, and they're following people in an MBA program, so nothing to do with medicine. The difference between how the person progressed from their MBA program to where they were 10 years later was just the fact that the male asked for raises more earlier versus the woman assumes from convenience, right? Well, I don't want to ask for too much because I don't want to feel like I'm being ungrateful or well, I don't want to ask for covering, you know, for funding for this conference because they probably going to say no versus the man was like, what do I got to lose? Let me ask if they'll give me $2,000 to fund my plane in this hotel. And nine times out of 10, they would say yes. And the times that they told the man no, some kind of way, there were other people that found resources to help him. may not have been fully, but it was to help partially. So I say that because I learned very early on after reading that book to just start asking for what I needed. You know, hey, do you know any resources that can help me get here? Because I don't have funding for this. Um, I did, I was a Gale House Fellow for the American College of OBGYNs when I was in residency. And I was the third Gale House Fellow. They're only supposed to pick two, okay, two. And initially I wasn't considered. And they said they really liked me, but they only have funding for two. And since the second one, their program was going to fund some of it, they didn't have funding to fund me completely. So I went to my program and I said, hey, they said that they could partially fund me. This other person's program partially funded her. Do, is there a way that I can get partially funded? And they said, yes. And that's how I became the third Gale House Fellow that year. To this day, they've only, that was the only year they had three Gale House Fellows. Every other year, they only have one to two. And the only reason I was Gale House Fellows is because I literally sought out other opportunities for funding to offset that which they did not have. And if I had not read that book before, I probably wouldn't have asked and I probably wouldn't have been a Gale House Fellow. And that, that, that fellowship gave me a great opportunity to lobby on Capitol Hill. I went to any dinner you could think of I went to. The Democratic National Convention. I was flown to Chicago for different meetings. I went to the RNC as well. I mean, there were so many things I got to do and so many people I got to meet. It was ridiculous. You know, I'm sitting there taking selfies with Nancy Pelosi. I mean, it was an amazing experience um, that I would not have had if I hadn't asked. So Sarah, I didn't mean to call you out, but I could tell by the way you said, well, I feel like I'm being a bother because we feel that way, don't we? It's okay. Like if somebody tells you no, just ask the next person. Sorry to pick on you. I just want to make sure you knew that we all feel like that sometimes. But, and I know women feel like that more of a time because we're nurturers. We're like trying to overanalyze situations when we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Another Sarah actually asks if you could repeat the book title and author. She seems to be interested in um, reading it. So one of the authors is Linda Babcock, okay? Like a Babcock clamp that we use for tubal ligations or sterilization. Babcock, B-A-B-C-O-C-K. Linda is the first name. And the book is called Women Don't Ask. Yep. Someone just wrote it in the chat, the chat, the other Sarah. Um, that was a great question. And I think to your point, it, it's a misconception, like different views from different sides. When you're the mentee, it looks differently than when you're the mentor. As a mentee, you might not necessarily know that they want it. It's just that their schedule doesn't allow for it, like you pointed right. out. So it's a misconception and miscommunication. 
Yeah, I mean, there was somebody that wanted that contacted me because I did one of these virtual shadowing um, programs for um, Shadow Bunny, who's another organization that's on social media. And one of the organizers said, hey, can you mentor me? I said, sure. And he really wanted to do, he's in high school, he really wanted to do research. But I can't do any research because I'm leaving my job and going to another job, which I'll be able to do research in a couple of months. But right now I'm between, you know, positions. So I said, hey, our head of uh, research is going to, um, you know, I'm going to give her your information and she's going to reach out to you. So I didn't have the capacity to do research, but now he's connected with my former colleague. I just talked to her today about him and getting him connected to um, two different research projects. So, you know, just because we don't have the capacity, we can connect you with other people that do, um, depending on, you know, what your interests are. So, um, so yeah. Another student asks about, and she says that this is a sensitive topic. So if, if it might be tough to answer, that's not a problem. But, and I think we discussed this also with Dr. Sims, being, especially in MFM, being involved with high-risk pregnancies, how do you go about comforting patients when it comes to miscarriages or abortions? Do you refer out to psychiatrists, like perinatal psychiatrists, particularly? It depends on the patient. I mean, some patient, every patient is a little bit different when it comes to telling bad news, especially if they've had a miscarriage. Um, I usually tell the patient, I'm, I, the direct approach is the best approach for me. I'm not going to beat around the bush with a patient. If I have a patient that doesn't have a heartbeat, I usually go in, rescan them. And then I say, Miss Smith, for example, I'm sorry that your patient, I, I'm sorry, your baby does not have a heartbeat today. And that means that your baby has passed away. I'm so sorry to be giving you this information. I just want you to know that this there's nothing that you did. Um, if the patient is alone, I ask them if they want me to call somebody to be there with them. And then if the patient is extremely hysterical, I, one, I usually get bad news with my nurse in the room, somebody else in the room to witness it. I usually ask if I can give them a hug. I usually try to tell them, depending on why the baby passed away, if it's early in the first trimester, I usually remind them that a third of pregnancies in the first trimester in a miscarriage and there's nothing that you did wrong, okay? It's really important for people to hear it's not their fault and it's nothing they did wrong. Um, I, so I try to reiterate that several times during the conversation. And then once the patient regroups, I usually go through the, okay, let's talk about why this could have happened. And depending on why it happened, I talk to the patient about things that we can do to reduce their risk in the future, or if it's something chromosomal, or I'm, I'm concerning, concerned about chromosomal abnormalities, I then ask her about genetic testing. But there's no right or wrong way to comfort a patient. I'm very empathetic with my patients. I tell them, hey, I've suffered a loss too. I've had a miscarriage too. I understand it. This sucks. I hate that I'm here on the worst day of your life. And I think when you're real with patients and you sit with them and you don't rush them, they appreciate that, you know, they appreciate you, you know, telling them your story and how you got through your miscarriage and telling them you're not in a rush to make a decision about how you're going to deliver um, and being candid with them about, you know, why they, why do you think this is happening without blaming them? You know, obviously there's sometimes that people have miscarriages. I, I know it's because of their gestational diabetes being so uncontrolled, right? You go with A1C is 12%. You have a super high risk of having a miscarriage. I'm still not going to tell them it's their, their fault. But when they have a follow-up visit, I'll say, you know, after they deliver, I'll say, let's talk about what we can do. And this is not your fault. There's nothing I can do to say that something could have definitely been done to prevent that, right? Sometimes it's just things that happen. And nature's way of taking care of itself, meaning a third of babies may end in miscarriage because there's something chromosomally wrong. Like, your baby's just too small to even see that and diagnose that. But then I'll say, okay, what, we, what can we do to optimize the next pregnancy? Okay. Let's talk about your blood pressure. Let's talk about your diabetes. Let's talk about getting to some goals. So you do all you can to make sure that you're not having another miscarriage. But sometimes even that is beyond patient's control. So I try to be realistic with patients and not rush them and listen to them and listen to them um, and, and their thought process at the time of that miscarriage. I hope that answers your question. 
I think it definitely does. And thank you so much for that because it's like you pointed out, there's the happy side of it where you're there. You pointed this out earlier. You're there for real when they're able to know that yes, they're pregnant and also able to deliver. Um, but there's those times when it's more so bad news than good. Another student or actually the same student asks a question on a lighter note about just the discipline to wake up early and to pursue such a busy life. How do you balance that busy life with your family and personal side? Well, I mean, I think that some things you have to let, so I'm not so anal that I don't let things go, right? You try your best. And after that, that's all you can do. Like some people beat themselves up when they don't do something. Um, I try to one, when I'm at work, I want to be at work. Like I'm trying to finish all my charts before I leave work. I don't like to take work home. Like some people are like, oh, I'm going to charge at two in the morning. No, that's not me. Like if I don't finish what I'm supposed to finish because I have to go and meet my kid at swim practice, I'm getting up early. That's why I do get up early so that the next morning I can finish those charts before I start my next day. Um, I think that now that I have a toddler, it makes it very easy for me to get up early because I'm used to functioning with no sleep. It's easier for me to get up early now than it was before I had a three-year-old. Um, but it, it just takes you setting your mind to, you know, getting up early. Sometimes people get up early because they need to work out. They can't function without working out. Sometimes getting up early means that I'm going to check these emails to see if I do have another opportunity for funding for something or replying to my mentor and saying, hey, I forgot to check in with you the other day. How are things going? You know, um, making sure that I'm not falling too far behind on my emails. Um, that getting up early allows me to, to drink a cup of tea and lay in the bed sometimes, watch an episode of Netflix, something on Netflix, just to, you know, get in a lighter mood before I go to work while I'm checking my, my messages. So sometimes getting up early doesn't mean I have to do anything. Sometimes I don't have anybody to round on in the morning. I'm still going to get up early because I just want to get my day started. It's to me, I'm more productive when I'm, when I'm not sleepy walking into work. Everybody's different. Some people are night people. I'm a morning person. Okay. So my nights and people tell you, like, I do stuff like this at night so I can talk to you guys. I talk on the phone. Um, I do social media, social media graphics. I do Facebook lives, like that kind of stuff at night. And in the morning, that's my like focus, email, work time. When I'm working, I'm working. I'm working through lunch. I'm working because I don't want to go home with that. So um, I think once you get your priorities, like and say, hey, I want to spend time with my husband and my child, you will automatically discipline yourself. Um, my son goes to bed at 8, 830. Like right now. I was with him before I got on with you guys. And I knew that when I got on with you guys, my mom was going to put him in the tub and drive him for a ride. And he's sleep. It's quiet out there right now. So he's sleeping. So that means that I can put him in the bed when I get off with you guys. I can watch Netflix while I'm checking my emails. And probably I'll be on social media because I'm on social media a lot. Uh, looking at, you know, TikToks and Reels. And you know, just sort of relaxing, you know, I do a lot of relaxing at night. I do a lot of, you know, policy, email, stuff like that during the day. I, I'm, I'm real bad, big on having my personal time. I, I mean, I think it's really important to set boundaries. Like after 5.30 PM, I'm not doing anything work related. You know, um, I'm going to allow myself to have, you know, meetings at, I like to start meetings at eight o'clock because I know that's time for my son to go to bed. So my mom or my husband can put my son to bed. So I have three good hours with him and I can run around and play around and do the PPL, the potty dance with him. And then at eight, I can start my meetings um, that I have for AMA or ACOG and things like that. And occasionally I have things that start at seven like this or a meeting. I try to say, hey, I you know, want to limit my meetings to two meetings a week after work hours. Anything else, if somebody asks me, oh, can you meet? I'm like, can you meet at 12 noon You know, during the day? Like AMA, Women Physician Section, we meet with um, our policy uh, coordinator. I met with her Monday at noon you know, um, during the break so that I can have my evening off um, with my child. So I think it's really important to maximize the time you have during the day and the things you do during your work hours so that you can be very carefree. And because of that, sometimes your family doesn't understand how important the things are you do, right? <laughs> so 
<laughs> my mom doesn't understand what I do. She called me all times of the day. And I'm like, uh, I'm at work. Um, because they don't understand because they feel like you're so stress-free when you get home. You can't be doing that anything that important, right? But um, but setting boundaries and sticking to it. Now, when I'm at work, I work like a dog. Like I'm trying to get all my work emails checked. I'm trying to, but for me, I'd rather work super hard during the day and have those hours off later on to just relax and do nothing. When I'm on vacation, like I do nothing. Like people that take their computers with them on vacation, that's not me. Like when you emailed me last week and was like, hey, can you send the slides in? I was like, listen, I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation. I will send you those slides when I get back on, you know, <laughs> the beginning of next week. And I think that as long as you let people know, hey, this is what I'm doing and these are my boundaries, I think that people appreciate you being open with them and saying, this is when I can do X, Y, and Z. So I think it's just being realistic with your with yourself and, and not putting too much on your plate. And if you put too much on your plate, taking a step back and telling people, okay, I don't have the capacity to do this. So I need help doing X, Y, and Z. Definitely. I think we actually had a session earlier with Dr. Harris. He was an internist, also a pharmacist and a physician. He said a lot of the similar same things where I think it was seven o'clock, nothing after seven, it would just be his own leisure time that he would take, like you said, maximizing what you have in the day and then whatever that ends up being relaxing at the end of the night. I think a lot of people end up just trying to extend their work hours over and over and at least to burnout in the end, which we've seen a lot. with physicians. Yeah. Especially in medicine with COVID. I mean, that really, it really hit home. Like you have got to just seeing so many people sick and dying. I mean, you really have to turn it off. I mean, especially with MFM, like I could literally think about all the people. It's just, mm -mm, you can't, you got to turn it off. There was a, the last job that I had, we had this Memorial Day with patients that had lost their babies, right? And we, they did a candle lighting ceremony for those patients. And I was invited as one of the physicians, but I also had a pregnancy loss, right? So I was also a patient. And I went there, it was after work hours on a Saturday. And I went there and I saw all the patients I had treated that year that I loved and adored me. I mean, they were so appreciative. I mean, people bringing me gifts, people were, you know, hugging me and crying. And I broke down because it was like an emotional, I was so overwhelmed because I'm like, oh God, that's the person that lost her twin at 26 weeks and the other baby's still in the NICU. And oh, that's the baby that had the major malformation and she flew to Colorado to terminate and now, and came back and we delivered her. And oh, that's the patient that had the quads and three of them died. I mean, it was just like overkill. And I like, bawled, like they lit those candles and I like bawled. And at that point I was like, nope, I am never doing this again. Like that my boundary was to not do anything on a Saturday. I should have never broke that boundary because it can be emotionally overwhelming when you see everybody that you've had to like do these Hail Mary procedures on even the ones that their baby survived but they stayed in the NICU a really long time it's still like emotionally overwhelming sometimes so um, guard your emotions and 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 make sure you set strict boundaries from between work and 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 things you do outside of work we have a lot of questions that are coming in. We really do appreciate, one student even said it herself, we really appreciate your enthusiasm and just the inspiration you're giving us all. It's both informative and inspiring all in all. Thank you so much, Michael. Let's go through the questions really quickly because I have some cases and then we can get to the rest of, I think I have three cases and then we can get to the rest of everybody's questions if they're okay with that. Yeah, definitely. I was, was thinking the same. Okay. The next slide. Okay, perfect. So we have the first case, and this is a typical case. This is a 32-year-old, gravita three, which means she's been pregnant three times. Para, which is what the P stands for, meaning this is how many pregnancies she had. Para one, meaning she had one full-term pregnancy, no preterm pregnancies, one miscarriage, and she has one live baby, okay? Now she's pregnant with quads at 31 weeks and three days. And so you can see the one, two, three, four pockets, four gestational um, sacs that's in that picture right there. She was admitted um, for rupture of membranes of quad A, okay? She was hospitalized and started on magnesium and she was given betamethasone for fetal lung maturity. And she was kept inpatient on bed rest. 
Um, next slide. So she was admitted, I want to say it was somewhere around 20 weeks or so, okay? Um, no, 21 weeks or so. Um, quad B ruptured the next day. And so you can see that baby, that's an ultrasound picture of that baby with no fluid around it. And she was kept on bed rest with the two ruptured sacs. She delivered quad A the next day. And at that time she was 21 weeks and six days. And that baby didn't survive because survivability is 23 weeks and zero days and 500 grams. There have been some case reports, especially with Texas Children's Hospital, which you know obviously is really big in intervention at 22 weeks and five days. That's the earliest intervention of a baby that has survived. And the end of that is an end of 45 cases that delivered at 22 weeks and five days over the last couple of years. And of those 45 cases, 11 survived until age one. And out of those 11, three were neurologically intact. And when I say neurologically intact, they're only like between two and three years old. So it's hard for us to say if they're fully neurologically intact. One has a G2, but one, the freeze last year was playing in the snow like nothing was going on. So. We presume that those babies are neurologically intact because they're meeting normal milestones. Next, um, next uh, slide, Michael. So she was kept on bed rest and she was kept in Trendelenburg, which means that we put her in bed rest and sort of tilted her toward her head to try to make everything go back inside the uterus. An attempt was made to give more medicines to stop contractions, but she still delivered quad C the next day, okay? Quad D delivered a week later at 22 weeks and six days, and none of those babies, unfortunately, none of them survived. So this is this is stuff we deal with. And usually with quads, we would offer them what's called a selective reduction, meaning stopping the heartbeats of two of the babies early in the first trimester to allow the other two babies to continue as twins. Why would we offer somebody that, right? Because twins have a much higher survivability than quads. And so we're trying to think of how do we get this person, any babies, to survive. We know that quads have a really high chance of delivering before viability. But when we counsel patients about this, sometimes they think, you're trying to murder my babies. No, we're trying to make sure you understand that there's an extremely high risk of delivering one or both of these babies. Okay, so, um, and unfortunately, what happened with this patient is none of her babies survived. Um, this is a case from last year that... Uh, that we had to take care of. And so you can imagine when a mom has suffered four different losses in the matter of two weeks, it's just overwhelming. So that was our first case. Next slide, Michael. Our second case was a 23 year old who presented at 29 weeks pregnant due to COVID-19. Initially, she had mild shortness of breath and a sore throat after going to a cookout at her aunt's house. She was admitted three days later due to severe shortness of breath, cough, and fever. And she was intubated two days later. She delivered via stat C-section due to an abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. Go ahead to the next slide. The mom remained intubated for three weeks and the baby is still in the NICU. Actually, the baby's not still in the NICU now. The baby's out of the NICU and then well baby. Um, she produced breast milk for her baby by using a breast pump, even while she was intubated. So we do that. Lactation specialists will hook a breast pump up to a mom and allow them to produce milk. And we give that milk to the babies in the NICU, okay, with the father of the baby's permission. Okay, that's what we do because we know that getting antibodies to that baby in the NICU is best. Okay. Um, the mom is now extubated, but still in the hospital. We see this very typically with COVID-19. People that are young and healthy and otherwise, you know, would not have a reason to be in the ICU, especially unvaccinated population, especially when we had the Delta variant on the rise. Man, I can't even tell you how many people I treated that were intubated with COVID-19 in pregnancy. It was um, just awful. Um, it was awful, awful, awful. Um, but luckily, this story is one that had a really good outcome. I can't say that about a lot of patients because we have had people that have lost their lives. Um, to COVID-19 that were young and healthy, despite proning them, despite prolonged intubation, despite all the experimental medicines we have, despite steroids. Um, some people may have underlying health conditions they don't know about. And some people, even without those underlying health conditions, really did um, end up with issues with their kidneys. Usually once we saw issues with the kidneys in COVID-19, we knew that was a bad prognosis. So um, luckily in these situations, 
we, we have gotten people through the hump. And also, luckily, with the Omicron variant, we haven't seen as many ICU cases. So the Delta variant was, I mean, my God, it was awful. But with the Omicron variant, people haven't gotten as sick. Even people that have COVID, if they're admitted and they incidentally test positive for COVID, they're not in there for COVID. They're in there because they have diabetes or they have high blood pressure or there's something else. The other times we used to see people that were intubated like this was the flu. And people sleep on the flu. I mean, when people, when I say people should get vaccinated because of the flu, they should get vaccinated if they're pregnant. Because people that are pregnant, your immune system is automatically compromised. And because it has to be, right, to not fight off the cells of the baby. Okay, a pregnancy in a baby is just a foreign object inside of you that's growing. So your immune system is definitely down to allow you not to fight off your baby's cells. But because of that, when you get things like the flu, it can really compromise a, pre a, a pregnant patient, even if they don't have a history of lung disease, it can. But especially if you're an asthmatic, man, it can compromise. I once had a patient when I was in Indianapolis that had asthma, really bad asthma, and she had chickens in her house and she ended up getting coccidiomycosis and, and superimposed influenza. It was awful. She stayed in the ICU for over 40 days. She delivered that baby and the baby was a month old, you know, and she was like, oh my God, I had a whole baby. You know, she woke up with a whole baby and I'm like, yeah, it, it can happen. Um, I once had a patient with Guillain-Barre syndrome because she had the flu and, you know, Guillain-Barre syndrome is ascending paralysis and usually incited by some viral infection with the most common thing being the flu. It can be COVID-19 too. But her ascending paralysis progressed to her diaphragm, which meant she needed to be intubated to, for help breathing. And you'll see her. I mean, she follows me on social media all the time. And every time National Guillain-Barre syndrome comes up, she tags me on her post and tells me how I saved her life because nobody knew what was going on with her. You know, they thought she was crazy. And I'm like, no, we need to intubate her. She probably has Guillain-Barre syndrome. And she did. Um, but those are the kind of people that we take care of. And I, I want to plug, please. If you have family members that are pregnant, make sure they have the flu vaccine because we've forgotten about the flu because we weren't getting the flu because flu droplets are big. So with, with us wearing masks, we, we didn't see the flu. But now we're starting to see more cases of the flu again because people aren't wearing masks. So um, yeah, but people with, that are pregnant with the flu can get very, very sick. All right, uh, let's move on to the next case, Michael. All right, so this case is a 24-year-old who presented at 23 weeks for further evaluation due to too much fluid. So if you see um, on the right side, we can see that we're measuring four quadrants of the abdomen with the baby. And the AFI, the, the amniotic fluid index is 32.34 centimeters. And normal is between five and 25 centimeters. So she has way too much fluid. And you can tell because this haziness that's there, you know, that means that the depth of fluid is, is way higher than it needs to be. Okay. Now, this was her second child. Her first child was pretty uneventful. Um, she had no medical problems that she was aware of and no family history of any um, genetic issues. Go ahead, uh, Michael, to the next slide. So the ultrasound revealed fluid around the baby's heart. That's in the upper right-hand picture. That's the heart with fluid around it. Anything black is fluid, you guys. And fluid in the abdomen. So you can see ascites or what's called ascites, that little fluid in the abdomen. And at the bottom, you can also see um, fluid uh, in the abdomen around, uh, sort of like a halo around the, the liver and the abdomen in the bottom picture. She also had fluid in the lung, okay, in the lung as well. And the amniotic fluid index, like I said, was 32 centimeters. And all of these findings were consistent with fetal hydrops. So fetal hydrops is when you have fluid that builds up in two or more compartments um, of a baby. So fluid that builds up in the brain, in the chest, in the abdomen, around the scrotum, in the extremities, and we see edema in the extremities. So if you have two or more um, compartments that are affected by too much fluid, that's crowd hydrops. And unfortunately, hydrops um, is a really, uh, causes the baby to have a really high chance of non-survivability. Go to the next slide, Michael. So there are different reasons for high drops in pregnancy. So she was evaluated thoroughly for high drops. So we usually do a type and screen because babies that have um, uh, antibodies. So if the mom is Rh negative, so you have Rh positive and Rh negative. So you can be A positive, B positive, O positive, AB positive, or you can be 
A negative, B negative, O negative, AB negative, right? So if the mom is any of those negative things, which is only about 15% of the population, but the baby is positive, so A positive, B positive, A positive, then the mom can develop antibodies from previous pregnancy that attack the baby's red blood cells or bone marrow, okay? And that can cause the baby to be extremely anemic, which can cause fetal hydrops. And that's just because the heart is working overtime to pump blood, but there's no oxygenated red blood cells because they've all lysed because of those antibodies. So we do a type and screen to see if there's a difference between the type and screen of the baby and the mom in terms of RH status, the positive and negative. We do infectious studies because we know that infections like COVID can cross the placenta and cause anemia. Um, herpes, simplex virus, parvovirus that dogs carry and they're asymptomatic in humans. It can cause slap cheek syndrome. Those viruses, some of those viruses can cause the placenta and, call, and attack the baby's bone marrow or red blood cells. We do a fetal echo because some heart defects can cause the heart not to pump effectively. And that can lead to oxygen not being delivered to those tissues, which can act like fetal anemia. So we then do a fetal echo to look at the baby's heart. And then we do genetic testing because we know that babies that have genetic problems have a higher risk of hydrops fatalis as well. Go to the next uh, slide. All right, so for this baby, the, the blood type returned a, a positive antibody negative. So it wasn't because of the antibodies. The fetal echo showed diminished cardiac function, but no abnormalities. And that cardiac function being diminished could have been just because the heart was working overtime and had become hypertrophic, meaning the, the muscle became thick in the heart, making it not pump as effectively because it's just getting worn out. Her torch panel, which is Toxoplasma gonda, gondii, other, all other, rubella, CMV, and herpes simplex one and two, that panel end up being positive, okay? And then um, she had genetic testing that was normal. And so when we look at torch, the torch infections, the torch viruses, other, uh, uh, COVID-19 would fall under other, okay? Uh, the flu would fall under other, things that can affect the baby and cause the baby to be really anemic. So of those, Toxoplasma gondi is the most common of the torch syndromes that actually cause the baby to be anemic followed by rubella, okay, which is why we get an MMR uh, shot. To, so if people that are unvaccinated can be more prone to rubella. And then uh, cytomegalovirus or Epstein-Barr virus, which people can get from kissing, high school people kissing, get mono, that can cause across the placenta and affect the baby. And then herpes simplex one or two. So cold sores or general herpes those, they can both cross the placenta and cause uh, fetal anemia and some other findings, honestly, congenital findings on a baby. Go to the next slide, uh, Michael. So since our torch panel returned positive, it was positive for parvovirus specifically. We know parvovirus is one of the viruses that can attack the baby's bone marrow specifically, okay? And it attacks the precursors of the red blood cells. So an ultrasound was done to evaluate the velocity of the middle cerebral artery of the baby's brain. So we evaluate fetal anemia by, um, I don't know if you guys have neuroanatomy yet, but we look at the circle of Willis in the brain. It comes back, okay? And then we look at the flow um, or the velocity of flow through the circle of Willis and specifically through the middle cerebral artery of the circle of Willis. And then if it's consistent with anemia, then we do what's called a percutane percutaneous umbilical blood sampling or PUBS, which this schematic is a schematic of the belly, okay, and the uterus. And you see that little line going down is us putting a needle through the uterus, through the placenta, and into the umbilical cord. And we basically draw blood from the cord through the umbilical vein, because we have two arteries, excuse me, through the umbilical artery. So we have two arteries and one vein, and we don't want to clot off the vein. So we don't go for the vein, we go for the artery. And when we're hitting this target, we're hitting a target of like three millimeters. It's tiny, y'all. But we're hitting that target. We draw blood. We keep the needle in place. We would draw blood. There's usually a medical student that's running the blood to the lab. We're calculating. They call us and say, this is the hematocrit of this baby. And then three people are calculating by hand the formula with how much we need to replace, um, how much blood needs to be transfused. And then we call the lab and say, this is how much blood you need to send us. And the medical student then runs back with the blood. And then we connect the port to the needle we already have in. And then we transfuse the baby in utero. 
Okay. So that's what we do with those types of, uh, of cases with fetal anemia. And that patient went on and the hydrox resolved and she did just fine. Okay. But if she would not have gotten that, then that baby could have definitely died um, without that. All right, Michael, next slide. So my life outside of work, it's not all work. So I have a family. I love to cook. I'm able to leave work on time. I take call one week every five weeks, like I said before. And on weeks I'm not on call, I tend to travel on the weekends when I, when, when outside, sounds outside is open back up. Uh, I usually travel with my family. Harrison probably has more frequent flyer miles than anyone. Um, I'm able to stay involved in numerous organizations. So like I said before, I'm on the ACOG board of directors, I'm an AMA, um, and I have the flexibility to chat with you guys and spend time with my son and my husband. My husband is actually chair of the music department at Morris Brown College now. So that's why I moved into Atlanta because he's already there starting. And my son Harrison is three now. He was two in that picture. And he is starting school on August 11th for the first time at Mount Perrin Christian Academy in Marietta, Georgia. And so um, I love my life. I think it's a great life and I'm very fulfilled with it. But as someone asked before, I mean, you do have to make sure you set boundaries in whatever field you choose. Michael, next slide. So the question you may be asking is, is it for you, right? So you have to be realistic with what you want your life to look like, okay? So go into each one of your rotations. If you are in medical school, go into it with an open mind, okay? And figure out if you like procedures or surgeries. Do you want to be more in the hospital or in the clinic, okay? Do you like having in-depth conversations with patients? Are you okay with giving bad news? Is family important to you? Is teaching important? Is research important? Because you have the flexibility to, to teach or not to teach to do research or not to do research? And do you wanna do private or academic practice? You can do either one, do an MFM, or you can do a combination of both. So for me, in my position at oh, the uh, Obstetrics MFM Specialist of Houston, I have privileges for St. Joseph's Residency Program, University of Houston and their residency program, um, uh, Texas Children and their program. I interact with fellows and residents as well, and I do quite a bit of teaching. But I don't have to. There are some people in my group that don't do any teaching. So you do have the flexibility of doing all this, but you have to know, is this something that you want to do? Okay, next slide. So this is my like go-to slide. And this is one of my patients that gave me permission to post. We went to undergrad together and that is her new baby that I delivered. She was somebody I did a myomectomy on at the time of delivery, meaning I, I basically had to remove a 13 centimeter fibroid first before I got that baby out. Um, but her baby did fine and she did fine as well. Um, so if you do need a mentor, if you're interested in MFM or you just want somebody to talk to about what you should be doing, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, you feel free to visit my link tree. Uh, my website's on my link tree and all my social media. You can scan it there. Follow me on Instagram. I know y'all are on Instagram. Go ahead and follow me. It's pregnancy underscore pearls. And then I'm also on Facebook. For I was told that people aren't on Facebook anymore. But I'm still on Facebook um, if you want to follow me on Facebook. And, um, and if you ever have any questions, you know, if you, uh, I'm not on Facebook as much in terms of messaging. I'm usually posting articles on Facebook and things like that. But if you wanted to reach out to me directly, if you DM me, I DM you right back. Um, so if you're on Instagram, I would definitely, you know, you can inbox me or, or you can email me directly, uh, either or. Okay. Now, back to the questions. Anybody have any other questions? So first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Plenty, for all the time you've dedicated towards this session. This has been such a great session. I don't think we've gone through MFM in the past, but we have had a few sessions over OB. So seeing a subspecialty like this after going through just the general specialty is really, really exciting. I do have a few questions. Hopefully we can get through as many as we can with the time remaining. The first being about um, a student who says that they've heard in general with OB and other subspecialties included that it has a high liability cost due to lawsuits slash patients suing. I can't imagine that how there might be even more so of that for MFMs being in a high risk field. How do you manage that cost? Has it been an impact for any colleagues that you've seen? Um, I, so I'll say this, 
OB has the highest liability. Uh, neurosurgery has the highest liability insurance. OB is second. Once you get to the subspecialty, our liability insurance actually goes down. And that's because if you're seeing an oncologist or you're seeing an MFM, we know you're at higher risk of a bad outcome, okay? You're coming to us because you're already high risk. So the likelihood that we're going to get sued is really low, okay? Most OBs get sued when it comes to obstetrical care because they're not referring. Like there's a high risk patient that's beyond their scope and they're not having MFM involved in those higher risk patients. The things that you hear about, like you hear about the, the pediatric resident that passed away in Indiana. I know you guys have probably heard about that. That happened a few years ago. Uh, her name was Dr. Wallace. She ended up having some complication in pregnancy and died after delivery. She didn't have an MFM in her care. So there's a lot of people, a lot of things you hear about that people presume that they're not high risk. I feel like people don't want to hear they're high risk. It's almost like, oh my God, I'm high risk. I'm like, it's good to be labeled high risk if you're high risk, because that means you have a lot of people looking at you to make sure that you're safe in the pregnancy. So MFMs actually don't have as much liability as OBGYNs. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a misconception there. Yeah. Another student asks about how you mentioned that there's the risk of the mother dying, there's the risk of the baby dying, and you are responsible for the care of both as an MFM. How do you manage that pressure when you're taking care of um, two people? Uh, and it's, again, high risk. Well, you know, your OBs are taking care of two people too. But I always think, how can we maximize the life of this patient and the life of the baby at the same time. And I always err on the side of the patient. Like, you know, you hear, you see those lifetime movies that are like, save my baby. I'm like, there's no way to save this baby without saving this mama. And if you think of the patient first, you know, keeping her safe first and then seeing how it impacts the baby and being honest and communicative and saying, hey, we got to deliver you because if we don't deliver you, something bad could happen to you. Or we've got to deliver this baby because this baby is at a good gestational age to survive. But we know this baby's going to the NICU, but the baby has a better chance of being in the NICU than being inside. So it's weighing the pros and the cons. But I always first err on the side of safety of the mom. Like a mom has DKA. And I'll tell a mom, we cannot deliver you in DKA. That baby can have terminal bradycardia. I'm not delivering that mom. Why? because that mom has a 70% chance of passing away if we deliver her in DKA and she has to understand that your baby could die. But I'm not going to deliver you to try to save the baby, knowing the baby's gonna be septic and acidotic and not have a chance to survive. And you have an increased risk of, of not, uh, not surviving. So we have to basically juggle optimizing the health of the mom and the health of the baby. And most of the time when I go stepwise and say, is the mom safe? Okay, the mom is safe. Now we need to look at the baby and see if the baby's safe. So I take them one, one step at a time. I'm also relating to this. A student asks about when it's the case that the, it's not at the mother's fault. So let's say there's the fetus that for one reason or another is not able to develop. Um, but it's not the mother's fault. So it's not due to a lack of nutrition or something that would be due to the mother's on the mother's side, right? For what the mm -hmm. mother's providing. What are causes that they might not be able to fully develop? Could it be genetic? What other might? So uh, some babies can't develop because there's something impacting development like an infection or there could be medicine. So medications are a big part. Like people that are on retinoic acid supplements because they don't want to have acne and then, then they slip them and get pregnant. Well, that can cause major facial clefts and major heart defects. And that can cause babies to pass away because they have heart, heart failure. Um, some people uh, have infections that are untreated. Untreated syphilis can cause congenital syphilis. Those babies can have congenital hearing loss, blindness, you know, things like that, uh, uh, increased risk of, um, of stillbirth. So there are different things that can cause a baby either not to develop correctly or be at higher risk of passing away in the third trimester. Um, sometimes there can be things that happen during a pregnancy, like mom in a car wreck. Now all of a sudden the mom, the baby has a bleed in its brain because of the car wreck. 
because the baby can also be impacted by trauma. Um, and so we have to explain that to people when they come a couple of weeks later and we say, oh, there's an infarct in the baby's brain. So the baby's had a little stroke. Let's talk about what that means in the baby. So um, our job is to work moms up and figure out the why. Sometimes we can figure that out and sometimes it's not a reason. We can't figure it out. Another question we have is about as an undergrad, being that most of the people here viewing our undergrads trying to go into medical school or healthcare school in general, what do you recommend from your experiences trying to make yourself a competitive applicant, trying to not necessarily um, showcase yourself, but prove your worth when you're submitting the application? So I would say in college, the best thing you could do is make good grades. I know people think, oh, I need to go shadow this person or I need to go and do this. But if you're doing all these things and I tell people I mentor, like, let's start with the basics. Show me your grades because we got to figure out, do you need to do a post back program? Do you need to retake this class in the summer? Like, how is this going to impact you? So making sure your grades are on point, especially your math and science grades, that's important in undergrad. So I would start there Two, if you're taking the MCAT, do the invest in the exam course. OK, I, I know that people are like, oh, my God. Kaplan review is like $1,500 or whatever is 15. Listen, do some, save your money, tell people what you want for Christmas is money so you can pay for their review class. Get in the review course, even if you feel like you're the best test taker, because that gets you in the train of my, uh, the thought process of thinking on your toes. And it's going to force you to go through practice uh, problems. It's going to force you to do timed exams. That is important. I'm telling you, you can do all the research in the world. You can have the best recommendations. But if you do not have a good, a decent MCAT score, it's going to be harder to get into medical school. I'm not saying impossible, but it's going to be harder. The other thing that people, I don't know if everybody's going to medicine uh, in terms of medical school or if you're doing other things, things that are also competitive that people don't realize, physical therapy school is competitive, okay? So don't sleep. Uh, you know, people say, I'm going to back up, use that as a backup. I'm like, don't use that as a backup because that's competitive. So you need to be on that just as if you're studying for the MCAT, okay? Because that's a very competitive field. Um, pharmacy is not as competitive as physical therapy, okay? P PT is competitive. Occupational therapy, not as competitive, but PT, competitive, okay? And then, of course, medical school and dental school is competitive as well. So I would say if you're applying to any of those, you know, do the review course and really be disciplined to get yourself through whatever bank you're going to use. Get through those questions. OK, and then when you get into medical school, when it's time for you to take step one, get through the questions, the old questions and getting yourself trained, even if you know the information, it's knowing the information good enough to recognize the buzzwords on the test. OK, it's not saying you don't know what you're doing. It's do you know how to take the test? OK, so a lot of these these programs are, are basically training your mind to answer the questions the way the test wants you to answer the questions, okay? And then once you become a doctor, you can do whatever you want to do because you, you have the knowledge base. You don't have to know buzzwords. Patients don't give you buzzwords, but the test, they want you to recognize buzzwords. So invest in that. I'm telling you, I came from a really rough background, low social economic background. My mom worked two jobs to put us through college. And when I tell you it's worth it, it's worth it to work some on the, in the summer, save that money, tell people you want, you know, $20 each so you can save that money on the side so that you can get in a review course. And if you can't afford to get in a review course, you know, always do at least a bank, okay? Get through the questions and do the bank. Get the book, read it from cover to cover twice and do the questions twice. Things your mentor can help you with is also funding these things, okay? There are, I mean, people I mentor, some of them don't have all the money. And I'm like, okay, let's take up a pot. Let's make sure we can get you through this review course because that's what mentors do. They try to help you get the funding you need because you're doing your piece and you've made the good grades and you can see, hey, this person's really gonna be a good doctor. So if the funding is the only thing that's keeping you in the way, there are mentors, we will help you get that funding, okay? So, um, but the course you have to, you have to take, okay? And then after that, then all the extracurricular stuff, then being the president of some society is going to help you, then getting shadowing experience so that you can get that letter recommendation from X, Y, and Z doctor that works at the hospital 
of the medical school you want to go to. You have two last questions I think we'll cover before wrapping up. And one of them is on the same topic that you've already been discussing about just preparing for med school with the sites of going to a U.S. medical school, I think is what they were referring to. Beyond the preparations for the MCAT, beyond just the extracurriculars, is there anything specific that isn't emphasized enough um, that we don't see as it's not something that people generally know of aside from the MCAT? So besides the grades are first, the MCAT is second. And then I would say uh, getting involved and in whoever is going to write your recommendation letters. It's important. Um, who's writing recommendation letters is important. If you want to go into medical school and you have a doctor that's writing your, your recommendation, that's going to mean more than your teacher per se, writing, writing recommendation letters. So making sure you have a diverse pool of people writing your recommendation, not just all teachers, not just your, you know, little league baseball coach, you know, making sure you have, you know, a doctor, your biology professor, and I don't know, your academic advisor, all writing letters of recommendation is going to be helpful. Um, and then the other piece that people don't really do in undergrad that makes them really stand out is research. You know, getting on a research project or doing one, and a research project can be about anything. It can be a health equity research project that you're presenting at something local, like uh, you know the AMA has a research symposium that happens every fall uh, in November. If you're in the AMA, this conference and interim is in Hawaii. That would be a great opportunity to present in Hawaii, and they do accept the majority of those um, those posters. And it can be in health policy, health equity. Um, it could be a quality improvement project. It doesn't have to be bench research or any clinical research, but having research is really important, okay? That is how you stand out because there's not, let me tell you, I review a lot of, of residency applications. People in, med, in, in, in undergrad, they're not doing research. And the people that are doing research, they get extra points. Yeah, a lot of times people just view it as a plus. It's not needed, but to your point, that plus it, it makes you stand out. Stand out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, applying to uh, applying from undergrad to med school, it stands out. Applying from med school to residency, it still stands out, but it's almost like expected. When you go from undergrad to med school, it's not expected, and so we're like, oh, they've done research. Mm -hmm. Applying from from uh, med school to residency. It does make you stand out, but there's so many more people are when once once they're in medical school that are doing research that it's not as special, I, I will say. And then when you're applying from residency to fellowship, if you don't have research, something's wrong. Like that's the reason that you're not getting an interview because you don't have any research. Yeah, it becomes more of an expectation as you go through the years. Yeah. And it's a misconception some people have. They might think it's it's different from year to year. But thank you so much for clarifying. One more question, I think we'll wrap up today's session. So you mentioned earlier, I mean, you went through a few cases already, three cases, and for the cases that you find very tough or that you wish that you could have done something differently, do you get together with your colleagues, other specialists, or maybe even OBs to discuss cases, review how you could have done things differently? Do you have meetings dedicated to that? Every week. So we, we meet weekly and debrief, and we also talk about cases while they're going on. I mean, it's not usually one MFM that's talking, even when I was like the only MFM, I was still talking to IU and doing m and and on the Q&A committee with OBs talking about what could have been done. Um, I sat on the state maternal morbidity and mortality uh, review board in Indiana. And it's, it's eye-opening to go back and say, this should have been done at this point. But yeah, as an MFM, my group reviews that kind of stuff weekly to see what can be done differently with this patient that's in the hospital. Okay, now the patient delivered, could we have done something different? Do we think a circlide would have been helpful in those quads to stop them from delivering? You know, and then you have people going back and forth. There's no data on that. That could have caused more harm and yada, 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 you know? Um, so yeah, we do have quite a bit of discussion. So MFM is also not something you do in a silo. It may seem like that because not a lot of us, but since we do work in multidisciplinary teams, there is a lot of shoulda, coulda, wouldas, what can be done better the next time. And sometimes we find we, there's nothing we could have done better, but we do definitely, we talk about it. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a prideless feel because we're not too proud. You know, it's like, let's figure out what we should have done. We're always talking about what, what do you think about this? Let me let weigh on on this. 
and we have a chat together. We're always talking about, okay, the guideline says this, would you do something different? Like, do you think we should do something different? Um, so we're, we're constantly getting feedback from each other. Yeah, just like we saw with Dr. Sims, OB in general just has this really nice, enthusiastic feel out for a specialty. We find that a lot of OBs just really are passionate for the field and they're ready, ready to discuss a lot about the, yeah. the cases improved. One more question that just popped in. Just a quick question. You talked about the research that helps you stand out going from undergrad to medical school. Does it matter what type of research it is? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you got to realize once you go into medical school, because people are like, oh, I'm interested in OB. It doesn't matter. It could be a research on frogs in a pond and how fast they move across. It doesn't matter. Okay. Because once you, people just want to know that you're interested in learning more. You're inquisitive enough to say, hey, we don't have any data on this. Let's figure out the best way to get to from point A to point B. It shows that you're inquisitive and you, you take a chance to seek more information. That's what research shows us. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter the field, right? So you can go into medical school. When you go into medical school, when you're applying as an as a, a undergrad, you just need to be applying as you want to be a doctor. Because when you get there, you are, may not want to be an OBGYN when you get there, okay? Something else might go be going on and you may say, I want to do that. So I knew I wanted to be an OB, but most of the people that I know that are in OB didn't think they want to do this. I had um, a friend of mine that thought he wanted to be a pediatric surgeon. His brother had um, his brother had a large uh, large uh, abdominal surgery when he was younger, and he said, "I want to be a pediatric surgeon." Wrote his whole personal statement about that. He's a neurosurgeon now. You know, he went through, he did rotations, and he realized, "I want to be a brain surgeon. I don't want to be a pediatric surgeon." So I would say, focus on being a doctor. So it doesn't matter what type of research it is. It can be cardiac research or, you know, clinical research in some random field, or it can be stats research, epidemiology research. It doesn't matter. Okay. Just as long as you have the research on there and realize that what you think you want to be now can change and keep an open mindset when you go to medical school and just like everything, right? Really try to like everything. Because your perception of what you want to do right now is based on what somebody else has told you and what somebody else is doing. But you may get into it and think, this is not what I want to do. When I got into my OB rotation in med school, the OB I was with hated being an OB. She made my life miserable. And I literally had to tell my advisor, I don't want to do a sub in this anymore. I'm really confused. I don't know what I want to do. And she said, wait a minute, let me put you with somebody else and see if you still like OB. And if you don't, I'll get you out of your sub eye. And I did, and I realized it wasn't OB that I didn't like, it was the person I was with that I didn't like who made our lives as students hell. So some of this is gonna be really trying to differentiate. Do you like this field or do you like this person you're with? Do you not like this field or do you not like this person that you're with? Can you see your life going like what you're seeing right now? What would you change? And try to see if this is consistent based on different people in the same field or not. So just keep an open mind. You may figure out something and say, I really want to do something else. For me, if I didn't do OB, I love OB. Like I love being an OBGYN. I love being a maternal fetal medicine specialist. But I watch my 600 pound life like every night. And I'm telling myself, if I had to take do it all over again, I would do <laughs> obesity medicine and I would do weight loss surgery and I would do all of the good stuff, but I would, I would miss MFM. So I think I made the right decision, but I say that to say, expose yourself to different fields, go in with an open mind. And then once you've gotten, you know, all the things, don't go into it with a preconceived notion, you know, do the pros and cons of each one. And then say, you know what? I think the best thing for me to do is this because of this, and this is going to fulfill me the most and go with what you would be fulfilled the most in. Definitely. I think that's, a great way we can end off our session. I love these last questions that really sum up what we've heard. Um, we can see also in the chat, I know that you're not on the chat, but on my end, I can see a lot of thank yous, appreciating the time that you've taken to speak. We're really happy to have you speak. A lot of students reference how they've heard about OB, but MFM as a specialty or just having heard about it a little, but not actually dived into it it's just new to them in general. So it's really, really nice to see a subspecialty within OB that students haven't heard of yet. Um, it, it's the kickstarter to exploring a little more. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Plenty. 
Of course. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we have a few reminders to our shadowers. So to earn certain uh, credit for your attendance, I understand that there's a few new people here to shadowing. To earn credit for your attendance, all you have to do is pass the quiz to receive a certificate. That quiz is now posted in the chat box. It's also available on our website under the virtual shadowing page. If you scroll a little below um, that page, you'll find shadowing quiz, Dr. Plenty. Click onto that and you can complete the quiz. If you earn at least 60% or higher, then you'll receive a certificate. This quiz would be due by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time on this upcoming Wednesday, July 27th. We have sessions in general scheduled on Mondays and Thursdays throughout the summer and even leading up to the end of this year. So that's our new schedule from now on. If you um, were with us in, earlier in the spring, it was Thursdays, but now we're shifting on to Mondays and Thursdays. There's a few other sessions that are on different days of the week, like the one that we had with Dr. Sims on Saturday. So to stay tuned with that, just follow us on Instagram, stay tuned with the flyers that we have, and we'll post the exact day and time that they are. Also, the listserv is a place where we post those too. After passing that quiz, like I said, you're going to receive a certificate, which would be specifically sent to the inbox of the email address you list on the quiz. And just in case you don't receive that certificate, feel free to email us. Um, but just in, before emailing us, please check your spam folder just in case. For our next shouting session, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Kaplan on Monday, July 25th, next week at 7 p.m. Central as always. Again, follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our listserv to receive consistent weekly updates over new shadowing sessions and other program announcements. We're expanding outside of our shadowing program to offer even more free resources to pre-health students like you. So we're happy to share them and we're hoping to spread out the word even that much more. Dr. Plenty, I know that you included it here. Let me share my screen again. I know that you included your email, your Instagram, your Facebook, um, and all that. So let me share my screen again for any students who want to follow or hear more from Dr. Plenty. Here's her handles. Um, any last things that you want to say, Dr. Plenty, before we end? No, um, I wish everyone best of luck on your journey in medicine. Hopefully I'll see you on the other side, <laughs> on the medical side, because <laughs> We definitely need more uh, more doctors uh, in the field. You guys know we have a shortage. So um, hopefully you guys will pursue medicine. If I can be of any help in any way, connecting you to anyone, please feel free to either DM me or, um, or send me a message. Um, and let me know, hey, I saw you on virtual shadowing um, so we can keep in touch, okay? Definitely. Again, we thank you so much for your time, Dr. Plenty. It was an honor to have you and... Uh, Honestly, it was one of the best sessions we've had so far. So we really, really appreciate your time and the effort that you put in. And I hope to everyone listening in that you have a great rest of your night. All right. Okay.